Hi, welcome to History Talks. I'm your host, Will. This is Sebastian. In this episode, we continue our series on ancient Rome, and we will be discussing the era between the end of the Punic Wars and before Caesar. So this is an era that is often overlooked, doesn't get as much attention as some of the other yeah. things, like the Punic Wars is well studied, but it's still important. There's a lot of things that happen that really impacted the course of Rome. So, yeah. um, so let's talk about those. For example, can you tell me about the Brothers Gracchi? Yes, the Brothers Gracchi, uh, Tiberius and Gaius, came during the se- came around into the political sphere during the second century BC. You see, Rome had been going undergoing a shift ever since the Punic Wars, namely the transference from of land holdings from uh, many uh, individual farmers into a few small, larger plantation collectives, basically. Mm, A few few richer Romans were buying up all the land and even using that profit to buy up uh, the farms of families whose uh, owners, you know, perhaps the father went off to war, uh, maybe even to get more wealth for, you know, the home, only to to return to find that uh, he that because he was not ten- able to tend to his uh, property, uh, it ended up being bought out by uh, some patrician. Wow, okay, and I can see how that would create a lot of tension between the citizens and the upper classes, right? So you have so you have a citizen farmer who goes off to serve Rome, yeah. and he goes off to serve Rome in the army, he fights, and he comes back to his home and to find his home has been taken yeah. by this this upper crust or this this elite class who he had been fighting for. So he's fighting for them. They essentially betray him while he's gone. And it's it's not just a single case. It was a uh, thing that was happening to a large number of people. So you have a lot of veterans coming back, um, losing their farms, and that's going to create a lot of tension, yes. I would imagine. And this all, not only did this cause problems for the lower class, but it also caused some problems for the upper class. Because, you see, Rome had a unique uh, view on admitting people to the army. Mm. You see, in order to join the Roman army as like a legionnaire, you had to own property. Mm. Th- this was not an uncommon system. It, in fact, uh, the Greeks had the same thing. Right. In fact, they even had the same thing where uh, you had to buy your own equipment. Okay. Um, that didn't come out. That didn't. That did not come out of the taxpayer. That came out of the soldier. Right. I understand that this, the concept of the citizen soldier, where yeah. the citizen had to be. You, you may have um, certain rights as a citizen, but in order to have those rights, you had to be fully invested in the system. You had to have skin in the game, and the way yeah. you would show that is by owning property in the system and by yeah. fighting in the army of the system. Yeah, it was viewed as almost a privilege to serve in the army as part of this, you know, Roman martial culture, you know. Mm -hmm. It was the main way to gain political rank, it was a point of pride and a way to gain wealth. So, oh, you had to own property. However, because people were losing their property, this resulted in manpower shortages. Mm -hmm. Now, Rome could still call up levies, you know. Even during, you know, the Punic Wars, for example, in addition to the property-owning legions, you know, they had called up plebeians as, like, you know, untrained levies that, right. to accompany the soldiers. But those weren't regular soldiers. Rome was, you know, running low on these much-needed, highly trained, and highly skilled soldiers. Right. And this caused particular problems in the Numidian War. Now, we'll get back to the Numidian War in a bit. Well, I mentioned, you mentioned that they're, they're more highly skilled. I think it's not just that. Well, that's that's clearly an they're important high, part of They're it. better trained they're, because would, they're regular soldiers. Yeah, I was gonna say, beyond the training, they're more invested in the system, right? Yeah. Because they, they own land in the system. They're, they have more reason to fight anyway. Mm. We'll get back to the Numidian conflict in a bit. But for right now, these property, this loss of property was causing problems for a lot of people, and people were thinking, okay, how do we solve this? The Senate wasn't thinking that, but a lot of people were. Okay. And, uh, 
Uh, Wait, was, was the, do you think the Senate was just oblivious to the problem? Yeah. They just, this is not our problem. We yeah. don't have to deal with this. This is for the little people to deal with. Yeah. Okay. So a third Punic, a veteran of the Third Punic War named Tiberius Gracchus mm. and his brother Gaius, uh, they get invested in politics. Now, they are, they're not the first. In fact, Tiberius' father of the same name had also been involved in politics, mm. but... Uh, Tiberius himself uh, had some very interesting ideas. Uh, namely, he, won he, he wanted buyback programs in order to redistribute the land back to the people, you know, mm. to reverse the effects of this, mono basically this monopolization of, you know, farmland. Interesting. Uh, and Tiberius was, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe he was from this, this patrician or this upper class yet he became a champion of the people. He became a populist politician. Um, I've heard conflicting sources. Some say he was like at the absolute top of like the plebeians, where others mm. say he was like lower patrician, and others mm. say like he was on the cusp of like, you know, crossing it, but it was hard to cross it back then. I, I've heard different things. But... Interesting. But we, all, we also know he had established himself as a successful commander during the Third Punic War. Yes. In fact, the legend, legend has it that he was the first to cross, to climb the wall. Yeah. So he was, he's a hero of Rome. He's in, within the, the eyes of the people in the Roman army. He is a, um, a heroic and victorious leader. Yeah. And his land distribution program is obviously not popular with a number of patricians who, um, you know, like owning a lot of land and having these massive farms from which they can gain lots of wealth. Right. Um, but his reforms are popular with the people for okay. obvious not, reasons. Yeah, not surprising at all. Yeah. So he. So this tension that I was talking about earlier with, with the veterans coming home, I mean, this tension comes to a head in the political um, policy or strategy. Of Tiberius. Yeah. And uh, when he finally gets elected office, I believe he's elected to Consular Tribune, mm -hmm. um, he, uh, you know, tries to go through with his reforms and to pass it. And, but there is resistance within other parts of the government. So, in order to, you, so he starts uh, what many would say is overstepping his boundaries in trying to get, you know, these bills passed in order to, you know, uh, enact the legislation he wants. Right, I see. So he's, he's representing himself. He's a man of the people. He has the, the backing of the people. The patrician class, for obvious reasons, doesn't like it because these land reforms would impact them negatively. And so the patrician class vetoes his whatever his policy he wants to implement, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he goes a little further, you know, trying to manipulate different parts of government to try to get his... Uh, legislation through and mm. some in, in the Senate actually uh, claim that he that this uh, that he's actually going for a power grab you know that mm. this is not so you know generous or he's just trying to get this legislation passed they're claiming that he may be trying to make himself a king mm, okay which is which is a, a big in the in the time of the Roman Republic, we are not yet at the days of Caesar or, or post Caesar, where we have emperors. We are in the days where kings are still viewed in a very negative light. So, um, whether he legitimately is interested in serving the interest of the people, or whether he's simply using them as a mechanism for his own power, mm -hmm. um, we don't know. But the Senate is threatened by him, and therefore is going to try to smear him as this yeah. um, as this wannabe king or wannabe tyrant. Yeah. And some fall, some believe the Senate, some uh, only become more opposed to the Senate when they claim this. Mm. But ultimately, this results in political violence. Okay. Namely, a big fight breaks out that results mm. in Tiberius' death. Wow. Yeah. Sometime that's late... That's some serious politics there. Yeah. Um, killing political rivals. Yeah. Sometime later, his brother Gaius uh, attempts to uh, live on Tiberius' legacy and mm. try to get this passed, but it, his efforts go nowhere. Mm, okay. Yeah. So this leaves us to the other side of, of how Rome attempts to solve this issue. Okay. And this other side is with a commander named Marius. Mm. 
Uh, he was he was involved in the Numidian War and noticed that because of the aforementioned issues, it wasn't going so well. Hmm. So when he is eventually elected a consul, he has his own ideas of how to fix the issue. Okay, and just to put some context here, so the Numidian War came after the Punic Wars, is that correct? Yeah, the, okay. they were attempting to conquer a region in Africa called Numidia. Oh, okay. Yeah. Maybe is was Numidia perhaps opened up by the, a power vacuum that was left when Carthage yeah. was, was yeah. Like, and, destroyed? Yeah, after Carthage was destroyed, Marutania and Numidia were open for the taking, but they were allied and they were resisting the Romans. Oh, okay. Then we can put a map up on the screen. Yeah. Too, so. Um, anyways, basically, uh, he, he had considered Rockian reform, but eventually what he, the decision he came to was instead a, a different solution. He would remove the property requirement. In fact, he would remove most of the requirements that would make it so that, uh, you know, a non-land-owning citizen would, uh, you know... Uh, he removed a lot of the requirements that were needed to join the army. Now, okay. now uh, soldiers were regularly trained, regularly conscripted, and you and you could join regardless of whether or not you had property. Mm. The Roman budget would uh, g Rome's own budget would pay for your equipment, wow. and he reorganized the army uh, into. Uh, Centuries and cohorts. Hmm. Now, a century is a group of 100 men, mm -hmm. and uh, six centuries make a cohort. Mm. Okay. And the, these were the new building blocks of the legion, with the uh, centuries being commanded by a centurion. Hmm. Okay, interesting. Yeah, so with this new organization, uh, Marius uh, he, he had. It had results, though many of the results were some that some historians say he could never have foreseen. Uh, whether this, w whether he realized what he had effectively done, is up for debate. But basically, what he had done by removing these restrictions is made it so that many of the soldiers were not as tied to Rome. They weren't tied to the property that they did not own. And set, usually they ended up just tying themselves to the individual personalities of their commanders. Okay. Uh, uh, right, I can imagine particularly if they have if they have a general or a commander who is you who is leading them to victory and they are getting rewards from it, right? Right. Mm -hmm. The general may say, oh, hey, if you go and conquer this territory, um, there will be great uh, financial rewards for you. I'll, well, I'll share the, I'll share the loot with you all, mm -hmm. right? So there, so yeah, so I can see why their loyalties would change. Before their loyalty was with Rome, that's where their land was. That's where there was a system that was designed to protect their land and extend their holdings, and they could mm -hmm. do this through military campaigning. But they found out um, they were losing their land, or now you have new conscripts or new soldiers coming up who don't ha who are not tied to the land in any way. Mm -hmm. They're just they're going around conquesting. So that that makes sense. That this, so they become they they gain more loyalty to their general, and I, and I imagine as we lead up to Caesar, mm -hmm. as we know, Caesar campaigned all over. That may have had something to do with with his rise, where you have where you have people who are uh, you have an army who's less tied to Rome, they're less tied to the idea of Rome, and more tied to their um, successful commander. Yeah. Now his new model of the army is able to uh, put to deal with the Numidian War, and he eventually and eventually Rome's focus turns. To a region in modern Turkey called Pontus, okay. and this and a war breaks out there. Uh, mm. Actually, this one is actually instigated by the king of Pontus, funnily enough. But mm. um, um, but with these uh, legions who are more tied to their commanders, uh, the consequences are are very quick. With an enterprising commander named Sola, mm. uh, who is Okay, so first we need to understand something that happens called the Social War. Okay. Now, 
there now while uh, the Ponchin War was taking place, um, another conflict was brewing uh, between various uh, factions within Rome. Uh, there were there was a bill to um, kick all of the non-citizen residents out of Rome, and there was another uh, that wanted to make all, all residents of Italy into citizens. Mm, okay. Okay, interesting. So those are, those are kind of two, uh, two opposites or two extremes. One was, if you're not a citizen, go. Right? Yeah. You're gone. Maybe, what, what were they going to do with their slaves? Were they going to keep them or kick them out too? Uh, I don't think they counted as residents. Okay, so re the non-slave uh, people who live there, they said, you got to get lost. That, that was one idea. The other idea was, no, I'll just include everybody in here. We'll make them all citizens, you know. Yeah, everyone we'll lower, in Italy. We'll lower the bar to citizenship. Just every, it used to be, you know, citizens that had this certain status and everything, but we'll just lower it and just give it away to anybody who's here. Yeah. Okay, so these are these are two competing factions. I mean, we have we see the, what's interesting is we see so many parallels today. Like in, yeah, you know, in the United States, for example, those there are two those are two comp competing um, political ideologies. You know, yeah. the, the more the open borders um, nation of immigrants idea, which is just invite everybody here. Citizenship doesn't mean anything if you show up and you're here. Then you you, know, you get all the rights of somebody else who's who's deeply invested in the system. Whereas there's people on the other side who will say just like the Romans did, uh, no, you have to be a citizen. Um, citizenship has certain value. It has certain requirements you have to go through to achieve it. And if you don't have it, get lost. Yeah. Now this results in the social war, which apparently social. Apparently the name social is um, a result of some weird translation. Mm. Uh, apparently they use the word sociae mm -hmm. in the original Latin, which doesn't actually mean social, but it doesn't. But it sounds like social, so okay. it usually ends up getting rendered that way. Mm. Um, what it what is in, what does happen is a sort of mini civil war breaks out um, um, within the. Uh, with a lot of the fighting taking place in Roman Africa, mm. the war is eventually ended, thanks in part to uh, Commander Sola. Mm -hmm. But the, you can start to see where some of the unrest that would lead to figures like Caesar rising would Absolutely. come up. Absolutely. Now uh, we're uh, like 23 minutes in, so okay. Yeah, you wanna you wanna go ahead and wrap it up. Yeah. Okay. So next time we'll talk a bit more about uh, one Sola and two, Caesar, and how they are connected, and how we finally go from Republic to Empire. But we'll talk about that in our next episode. All right, that sounds good. Thank you, Sebastian, and thank you, everybody, for tuning in, and we hope to see you all in our next episode on Ancient Rome. All right. How did you feel about that?